This photo was taken um, in uh, Quaviet when uh, we, this was about uh, December of 1969 when we were on a operation to, uh, they were, the uh, NVA had been putting up mines or setting out mines in the, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin and uh, uh, we were setting up night uh, perimeters, uh, night ambush, try to intercept them from uh, get them before they set up the mines. Uh, yeah. They did mine sweeps every morning, and this is, uh, that's Ken Ownby, he's from Ohio, and, and uh, uh, nickname a crow, uh, but it's Daryl Snyder. We had, a lot of our guys had nicknames, and right. sometimes yeah. I have to think twice what their name was. He was yeah. from the state of Washington. That's the fellow on the left? Uh, I'd be on our right on there. The right yeah, that's, yeah. uh, and he was carrying a radio uh, that day for our platoon, okay, yeah. and uh, that's Lieutenant Wood from uh, from Massachusetts, and uh, I, I was telling you a while ago, every picture I have of him, he's he's talking on the he's radio. On the so radio. the yeah. lieutenants, uh, you know, that was kind of what they did. They was getting yeah. orders from higher up, and then he would uh, talk to his uh, squad leaders and yeah. platoon sergeants. Which at this time, I think I was a, uh, a squad leader. Okay. Which usually, if it was fully uh, manned, it was like uh, ten, ten guys yeah, or ten so. Guys. Wow. And uh, and like I said, we were with the uh, CBs over there. Uh, that was their fire base, or and okay. uh, and so. So are you, you're right on the coast here. Right on the coast, Gulf okay. of Tonkin. There. We, so you're saying the NVA would would come down and and they'd set up mines around the the, right. the CB base. Uh huh. Sort of yeah. Like well, that. they would set up mines out in the the uh, the waters there, the Gulf. Okay. And so when the ships come in, they it was they it was uh, aimed toward you know hitting the boats oh, and the I ships. See. And so they we weren't personnel mines. They were to oh, blow okay. up the yeah, ships. Ship mines. Yeah. But they would go out into the water from that coastline. Right. right they would set them out pretty close and uh, yeah. and uh, you know we we did intercept. Uh, uh, a group and 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 kill several and they were they were they everybody thought they were Chinese they were a lot taller than the NVA and and uh, they were had look new uniforms on so I think it was some some of the Chinese and whether they were part of their training yeah. or they were working yeah. with the NVA yeah. but uh, several of them were ch probably Chinese uh, that we I've actually heard that killed a lot them. yeah you know, these guys are bigger and right. you know, got the newer uniforms yeah exactly. And so on. Now the the fellow there, um, the guy carrying the radio on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that that he's got tucked into his helmet there? That that's some oil, and about everybody had a, uh, some oil and uh, to kind of to keep the uh, M16s and our weapons uh, lubricated and well oiled. And most people have a like a shaving brush also in their helmet to you know to get in and get the yeah. dirt out and clean it up. And so yeah. It's real important to keep the, the weapons well lubricated yeah. and, uh, and uh, oiled up and clean. Now, I, we were talking uh, on a different occasion, and you said that when you were there in 69 and 70, the M16s worked pretty well worked so long pretty as you well. kept them lubricated. Right. Okay. I, yeah. I did have mine, uh, as I'd mentioned before, like I said, uh, jam on me one time, and then it wasn't my regular weapon. It's one that I grabbed, and mine had been misplaced. and. Uh, and it jammed, and that puts you in a pretty bad situation. Yeah, you know, well. you know, Did you guys down. know at the time that there had been problems with the M16 I, before? I didn't. Some, you didn't some know. probably did, but I, yeah. I didn't. But yeah. Tell us about that situation when when the the, the gun jammed. I mean, can you just well, describe we were, that for us? Yeah, we were going on our armored personnel carriers through some pretty heavy brush, and uh, we just we got ambushed. Uh, it wasn't you know a major ambush. It was probably more of a harassment, but it was kind of a hit and run kind of a thing on their part. And yeah. uh, but you know we did have a a little firefight that went on there for about 30 minutes. And you know my weapon jammed, and and uh, about all I could do is uh, is hunker down and be glad when it was over. I did find my weapon before it was over, but it was about about over by the time I found my weapon. But it's it's just a really bad feeling. I, I don't know yeah. how to describe just it. Just kind of helpless. You know, huh? helpless and, yeah. and, uh, and just not in a situation where you could 
you know, somebody else could, could get another weapon to you. Right, yeah, uh, everybody's busy everybody's shooting busy, with yeah. their own weapon. <laughs> you 30 minutes not able to pretty, use your weapon pretty while intense. all this is going on. Pretty intense during that time. Yeah. Gosh, I bet. This is some of the really um, terrain that we got in occasionally that Agent Orange had not, uh, you know, defoliate, defoliated and, and mm. killed out. So yeah. sometimes we get in some really, really heavy brush and, uh, I mean, it's just almost impossible to walk through. We'd take turns with our machete, you know, cutting a, a little trail and, and uh, you know, as hot and humid as it was, it just wear you down and we just kind of kept rotating one guy moving up and just kind of switching off every few minutes uh just kind of beating our way through there yeah i mean in that kind of thick brush not much of a breeze huh? not any breeze at all in yeah. there tell us about the you know the just the environmental challenges putting the vc and the nba aside you mm -hmm. know you're in that thick brush and right. just and then then sometimes you're on the beach but what are the what are the, the environmental challenges you do? Well, with this mosquitoes was a, a biggie. Yeah. Um, we did have uh, some spray that was supposed to uh, kill mosquitoes, but uh, and it, it had a warning out there not to get it on your skin, but we'd spray a puddle in our hands and wipe it on our face. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and you couldn't put it on your lips or it would burn, and, and that's where the mosquitoes... But mosquitoes yeah. was a huge uh, thing, and then of course you know there was other. Uh, I ran across a cobra snake one time, and uh, I've yeah, talked yeah. to other people that uh, you know had encounters with, uh, yeah, with snakes and things like that. Where, and when you came across the cobra, you were just out on patrol. Or I was on a patrol. We was walking in columns of three. Um, I really didn't have visual contact with the other columns, and we were supposed to be uh you know pretty stealthy trying to come up on the enemy without them knowing it without giving away our position and i come to a small clearing and uh here's this great big long probably eight or ten foot long cobra just laying there sunning and he saw me and his old head raised way up and his neck swelled up and and i'm trying to decide what to do i didn't want to shoot him i was afraid i might shoot some of my own men because i didn't know how far over they were and, give away our position and while I'm pondering all this he uh, he just <laughs> goes and takes off out. so I did get on my radio and I told him I said watch where you step because I just come across a big yeah, cobra there yeah. so uh did that mosquito stuff actually work did it keep them yeah it, you know it uh, not real long term you kind of had to keep putting it on mm. and um yeah. It had a very distinct smell to it, and I'm sure probably the NBA probably smelled that and probably knew <laughs> where we were yeah, from we got that. some American soldiers had their way. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, it seemed like at nights when they mostly bombarded. Um, I remember the my... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. i never forget my... Uh, one of my uh, Hispanic friends, uh, he uh, he woke up and he said, uh, hey, Leach, my lips feel kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they look kind of funny because the uh, the mosquitoes had been bombarding oh, him all night no. and they were all swelled up. Because he didn't uh, have the stuff in his lips. Couldn't put it on the so lips. The mosquitoes look for the spot that's not Yeah, that. so they found a good good place. And, uh, yeah, and what was, the, what was the temperature like? Mostly well, it well. varied, you know, uh, the the time of year and the monsoon. Uh, it it got up, you know, over 100 uh, sometimes, and then at night, uh, in, in certain areas uh, up north, you know, it probably got down in the high 60s or at least okay. low 70s. So, you uh, you get wet and uh, you know you get cold and. Uh, so you're wet all the time, but sometimes it's hot, wet, and sometimes yeah, it's cold. Yeah, yeah, you're either yeah. sweating or getting rained on. My, when I first got over there in, uh, I guess it was uh, October of mm. uh, 69, um, it was during the, the monsoon was just starting, and I mean, it rained every day, all the day. And, you know, you're just soaking wet and chilled to the bone. and. Yeah. It's when you have to give yourself a little pep talk, you know. I'm thinking, you know, darn, I can't take this for a year, and you just have to say, you know, you can do it. Just buck up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a reason why the guys are checking off the calendars, right? Right. Yeah. Did you have one? Well, of those I had a short time calendar. I, uh, that I, uh, I think I started coloring in when I was about 90 days. Uh, that's when you start thinking, well, maybe you're going to make it, you maybe know. You're make it out. And. Uh, 
So yeah. every day you try to color in a little mm. spot. I've, did you, did you I've, still, I've still got it somewhere folded up in a oh, wow. trunk somewhere. But. That reminds me of, a, of, a, of something I've heard you say uh, recently, and that is um, I think you had just a week to go or so, mm -hmm. and uh, you didn't have to go on a certain operation, right. but you volunteered. And yeah. So um, I wonder if you could tell us about that, because you know, a lot of guys could say, hey, I've, you know, I've, I've done my... Yeah. Time, I've seen plenty of action, and yeah. I've got a week to go, and I'm not going to risk it. Right. I don't think anybody would blame you for doing that. So right. Why did you, why did you volunteer well, yeah. to go back out with the guys? I guess, first of all, they were going up to Quezon, uh, where Quezon had, had been fought, and uh, I'd never been that far west. It was, uh, we went nearly to the Le Ocean border, and uh, yeah. I guess curiosity, one thing, and the other thing was, you know, uh, you know I was still still there and and uh, you know still was uh, uh i don't remember if i was i think i was a i'd been a platoon sergeant i think at that time i was probably a squad leader and uh, you know i just felt like i should be with my men you know i just felt like i guess i'd be slacking if i didn't go mm, you know yeah. so how did that operation go uh you know we went up there we we dug in we uh, really had some fortified uh you know foxholes with sandbags and had lots of ammunition and and uh but we never made any contact so i i, I think maybe uh the big brass probably thought that uh you know they were going to draw out uh, the enemy bring them but it, it didn't develop for whatever reason apparently they thought there was probably from uh, yeah. The uh, tactical operation command or whatever, you know, probably yeah. had detected movement up there and probably okay. thought the enemy were trying to infiltrate and they, yeah. uh, is what I figured. Sure. I didn't know yeah. for sure. Uh, but you didn't, on that We, did, we didn't make any contact that time. And you said you're at Quezon. Right. You went to, to Quezon. This is 70 then, 1970? Uh, yeah, it would have been yeah. 70. So by that time, if I remember right, Quezon had been abandoned basically right. the US had, had left Quezon. Yeah, you really couldn't tell they'd ever been there uh, right. it would yeah. I guess when they pulled out they brought the dozers in and filled in the, yeah. their bunkers and leveled it and uh, all the vegetation had grown up and really there was yeah. hardly any signs that anybody yeah. had ever been there but you must have known at the time about the big battle that had taken you know place I, Quezon, I just kind of knew about it I didn't yeah. know the extent I, I do remember, you know, uh, getting a letter from home and talking about all the, uh, you know, that was going on on the different campuses, the protest and mm. and the war uh, effort. And uh, yeah. in fact, uh, one of the big battles we had in uh, November, North Vietnamese Army was trying to get up a big uh, a battle to overrun uh, Northern I Corps. Uh, and trying to do it in conjunction with a major protest that they were that was, uh, being, planned. That was being planned, and there was a date that they were going to have millions of people, you know, protesting all over the country, and they were going to try to uh, mm -hmm. uh, wipe us out at the same time coordinate. to coordinate it and uh, persuade the uh, sway the people that you know this yeah. is not a good thing. So well, they I mean, used psychological warfare as much as yeah, anything. Exactly. Sure they, did. they saw the protesters, from their point of view, they saw the protesters as allies. Yeah, and they used to drop yeah. leaflets. I'd find leaflets. I, I wished I'd have saved some of them talking about, you know, and, and some of them were aimed toward the Afro-American, you yeah. know, why are you fighting this war, sure. you know, and this is not your war. Taking advantage of the... Trying to take advantage of the... the civil you know, rights the strife. The division, the right. They, they look at it from every angle. This is the disadvantage of, uh, of uh, in, in a context of war, the disadvantage of a democracy, right? Because mm -hmm. all the media in North Vietnam is controlled. Right. Right. But right. you've got, you know, the three network stations, CBS, NBC, right. ABC, just letting the American people know what's going on in the right. country. But, of course, the Vietnamese can see that, too. They right. know about the protests. They know about the civil rights strife, and they take advantage of that. And turn that against you know, right, yeah. and and occasionally on our, we had some little old battery operated radios that sometimes we listened to, and uh, the, what was her name, Hanoi, um, Hanoi Hannah, Hannah, I think that yeah. was she. We get her once in a while, and and you know she would say, you know, 
try to psychologically sway us, you know, why are you doing this and, you know, all the mm -hmm. ins and outs. And so they, they, they tried it from every yeah. angle. But was she, uh, was Hanoi Hannah, I think that's I the think name. I think it was, was she, yeah. Uh, was she effective, or, or did you guys I, sort of no, think of it as a joke? And more time? of a joke, yeah. 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 And we didn't. We on, I think I only tuned into her, and that was when we was at Quaviet. I think it's the only time uh, maybe the reception was better there. We were closer. I don't know on the beach. Yeah. So anyway, it's the only time we really had a chance to listen to her. Yeah, yeah. Do you when <coughs> you think about the protests? Do you make a distinction in your mind between uh, the college kids? who don't really know anything, but you know, they're protesting. And maybe they're sincere, maybe they're not, but the college kids protesting. And then the Vietnam vets who came home and joined the protest, do you make a distinction in your mind between them or, or not really? Oh, uh, you know, not really. Uh, you know, I, it, I try not to judge people and, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm, whether the war was right or wrong, you know, the reason that, uh, you know, I was there, it was to fight communism and, and give people their freedom. And so that, that was my uh, reasoning for, for fighting this war. And, and I didn't know, and most of us didn't know all the political ramifications, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and the, it was uh, everything that was going on in the background, uh, yeah. you know, the fact that, uh, you know, Johnson was saying, you know, and pretty much knew all along we wasn't going to win the thing, but still he's yeah. putting young people's life on the line. I mean, it uh, it wasn't fought in the right way. Um, mm. You know, there were some good soldiers uh, that weren't yeah. able to do everything that they could. But we just didn't fight it to win. And you and you're just referring to like the rules of engagement, for example, like mm -hmm. having to get permission before you can use artillery and things like yeah, that. Yeah, that that wasn't a, a big thing for me because, yeah. uh, but you know, it didn't make sense that uh, you know there was an NVA encampment just on the other side of the DMZ that we couldn't do a thing about. Yeah, uh, and that that seemed pretty pretty crazy. I mean, all we had to do is drop, you know, one bomb off on them, and that would be it. But you know, they're training guys yeah. and. and uh, and uh, you know, supplying them and just yeah, send them yeah. right across the line right there. We're in their backyard, yeah. but and we could actually see when we got on some high places and uh, and when the monsoon kind of quit, you could actually see their encampment. You know, it's like four miles probably on north miles. of the DMZ. Yeah, it was just you can see as it. far the other side of the DMZ as we was on this side. So and of course they know you can see them. Yeah. And can't yeah. do anything about it. It's like they're thumbing their nose at us, oh, you know, yeah, but that's, uh, in yeah. their backyard. So, yeah, you know, it, like I say, there was a lot of things that just wasn't uh, mm. fought right. I guess, the, you know, I guess one of the responses there is concern about, of course, collateral damage, but then also worry that, uh, you know, like in the Korean War, China came into the war and worried about China coming into uh, the war, although it sounds like, from what you say and from a lot of other vets say, China was already in the war. Right, they, they were. Sending their and soldiers in there. Soldiers and supply, and Russia, you yeah. know, was supplying weapons and yeah. ammunition. And yeah. So, That's yeah, right. I think they were afraid of pulling other countries in and making a major thing. And mm. I guess Vietnam, uh, we understand it was an undeclared war, still right. considered war, but undeclared. So we really undeclared hadn't war. declared war, which yeah. I guess restricted, you know, probably doing more. This was uh, at the, uh, we're still here at the Gulf of Tonkin, mm -hmm. getting fed good by the CBs, mm -hmm. which was probably the best um, uh, duty I had, you know, during that 30 time, because we did get some good square meals from these guys. So the, the Navy's good for something. They're anyway. good for something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plus yeah. maybe building bridges and a few other good things. Yeah. Now they treat us real good. Yeah. But, uh, well, we were getting ready to go out, you know, into the field, uh, set up some perimeters, and uh, this kind of shows some of the gear that we had. Yeah, um, had, your, had, uh, had our steel pots or helmets on, and you can see yeah. my brush and my oil there, and we yeah. usually carried one to 200 rounds of uh, M60 machine gun fire and we carried uh, a couple of canteens of water and we had uh, grenades, usually five or six uh, grenades and uh, yeah. of course you hear, you know, war stories about during a lightning storm, the electrical 
you know, setting off some of them or a claymore, but I never did see that happen. But, that. And most of us carried a little, I think it's a pound thing of C4 explosive. Okay. Um, That's for if, mines or for uh, yeah, um, if we had ambushes? We oftentimes, no, uh, we would find, uh, uh, you know, a, a 500 or 250 pound bomb that didn't go off and we need to blow it up. You know, we uh, would yeah. use our C4 and oh, add I a see. detonating I cap see. in it. And yeah. uh, so we carried a claymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, claymores we set up around our perimeter and had a a cord to run to it and a little electrical charger and yeah. M16 and a, a bandolier around our neck there that had uh, probably, oh, um, I think about maybe 15 uh, magazines of M16 ammunition and uh, yeah. our whatever you, we need to eat had C rations and uh something to sleep on a poncho i see the poncho yeah and uh, something to dig a hole with it's and um, this one we were legging it or going out of foot you know a yeah. lot a lot of times we would i had mentioned earlier that i was a mechanized unit and we we rode on m113s which is an apc or armored personnel carrier yeah. that's on a track and okay. we'd carry a lot of our stuff and then we would leg it out from there uh, on this particular operation, we're just legging it all the way, carrying what we need. And in my pocket on the left there, uh, I had a map. Uh, and then I've got a little, the squad leaders had a little radio. That thing on my helmet there is a little receiver. Okay. And it seemed wow. like there was always static on it. So I had to try to filter that out when wow. you're listening for other things. And then uh, yeah. I had a little radio clipped right here that I could keep in contact with the uh, Wow. My lieutenant. How much does all this stuff weigh? I I think they say about sixty-five to maybe seventy-five pounds. And how many miles might you put in? Oh, sometimes this stuff? we'd walk, you know, several miles. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to walk five miles. And yeah. uh, and then sometimes through thick bush with all that stuff on. Sometimes in this particular case, it's mostly going through sand and. Sands. Pretty typical looking like you'd see in a desert. There'd be little shrubs here and there yeah. poking out through the sand, but wow. it wasn't very rough terrain. And, and then so you're lugging particular. all that stuff for several miles in 90 degrees, 95 degrees, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Wow. How many uh, canteens of water would you keep with you? I usually had two. I think that was a one okay. liter there, and I had a, a bigger kind of a rubber one that's more collapsible. I, I was probably on the other side that I carried, and I think it was maybe two liters. Probably wouldn't take long to burn through two liters of water. It wouldn't, and I, I remember one uh, operation we were on uh, way up in the mountains, and we ran out of water, and uh -huh. uh, it was like 100 plus degrees, and wow. uh, and uh, it uh, it wasn't a good feeling. That was the time that I uh, I found water in an old bomb crater, and I filled up my canteen and and put a couple of uh, iodine tablets in it that was supposed to supposed to put it in there and let it dissolve for 30 minutes, so uh, you know kill the bacteria and it at least made it drinkable. But you know when you get thirsty, you will you will drink something, and bet, yeah. people were starting to get a little panicky, and they probably they finally brought us some water in a helicopter. And uh, they brought us some soda water, grape, grape ed, some kind of grape pop was what we usually got in cans. And everybody's supposed to get a half a can. A half and a can. And some guy drank a whole can. And he was, uh, you know, That's this one cool. guy said, and he was not just kidding, he said, I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, I mean, that was just something you didn't ever want to do was was not, not share or split things up yeah. even. That's just yeah. a... Yeah. It was a bad thing, and so I said, "Well, you know what? He, he, that's my half that he drank, and uh, so that kind of calmed things down." But I didn't get any great pop that day. But that was you were the squad leader at this mm -hmm. time, so that yeah. was your way of resolving that. Yeah, yeah, yeah resolving that, and, that uh, problem. The, he wasn't very popular. But the, <laughs> the other guy that was in that picture was that's his that's name good. was Cheek, and he was on an armored personnel carrier that hit a mine and flipped it over. And, and he was in a coma last time I saw him, so oh I boy. I hope he made it all right. Oh, but uh, you're you're still not sure. Whether I'm still he, not sure. He made it. I, like I say, his name's not on the wall. Oh, okay. So at least it uh, didn't kill him. But I, I don't know wow. how he if he had any 
Yeah. You know, neurologic deficits after that or, right. or not, you know. So he was, his, uh, it was an APC he was on, mm -hmm. was hit by yeah. a mine. And mm -hmm. Just flipped it clear over. Flipped it, he was in a coma and then got dusted off and that, right. that's it, that's mm -hmm. the last you, you knew. Or yeah, know. well I got dusted off with him uh, and I still saw him when we, we unloaded him at the, uh, the uh, military little hospital there and yeah. uh, he was still in a coma so that was several minutes later. Wow. So. Uh, wow. And you were dusted off as well, mm -hmm. so yeah. you were also wounded from the same incident? Or? Right. It it threw me a long ways away from the track because I was sitting up front and it just kind of catapulted me wow. uh, way out there and, and I had a huge swelling on my side here and a big bruise and yeah. uh, just I guess I was knocked unconscious for a while. But uh, Jeez. a lot of men were, there was 10 of us on there and all of us got medevac. Everybody, one, one fellow ended up with a broken back that fortunately didn't paralyze him. Um, he's, he's okay now. Wow, so 10 guys on this one APC, all of them wounded in one way or another. Right, yeah, we were, uh, we were going up a hill yeah. and two or three tracks had already just gone over our same, same thing we're going and, and it was a pretty steep hill and, yeah. uh, and I remember we were, uh, it, the APC was kind of chugging down and we were all going, go, go, go. <laughs> and it went. Uh, oh, no. So Jeez. that's when we hit the How line. long were you out? I, you know, uh, my, the first thing I remembered was my lieutenant. I was trying to get up and I just kept falling. And uh, my lieutenant uh, was saying, you know, stay down, Sergeant Lee, stay down. And... Uh, so enough time for him to get over to me, probably, I don't know, a couple of minutes. Probably it wasn't out very long. But yeah. How long did it take for the helos to come get you? Oh, probably 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And then a 15-minute ride to wherever probably, you went after that, 15, yeah, 20, something yeah. like that. Wow. Yeah. And so how long were you in the hospital? Well, uh, not very long. I uh, I had, like I said, a huge swelling that probably looked like a football, uh, just probably a hematoma or blood field thing, probably. Um, and I I remember laying in that bed and I just uh, I was restless and and uh, I told him I wanted to get back. <laughs> so get back I was probably there a couple of days and uh, they sent me back and. Oh. I swore I'd never, that was the second one of those uh, I'd been on the head of mine, and I swore I'd never get on another one, but wow. probably two or three days later I was back on one, so. They got hit by mine again. Well, I, uh, that was the second one I'd been the on the head one. of mine, but, and that was the last one. Okay, so you're on two, two different two, APCs. Two different, yeah, yeah. The second one was more, it, more it serious. It probably was a bigger one. They think they had either two of them stacked, or either that or it was an anti-tank mine, which was a little bigger. Wow. Um, wow. Somewhere I've got a picture one where, you know, sometimes after rain, uh, they'd wash the top off of them and we'd, we'd find them out in the field where they had buried them. And, uh, Jeez. Uh, Pretty resourceful enemy, huh? They were. They yeah. tried a little bit of everything. This is a soldier, uh, Orlando Wright. He was one of our uh, APC drivers. Uh, you can see him cleaning his weapon here. He was down in a, this is back at Conti Inn in one of our big uh, bunkers that they had big, you can see big timbers and oh, yeah. they were partly underground and big timbers on top with dirt on top of that. So when we came back to uh, our base camp, that's where we, where we stayed, uh, Orlando was driving the mine that we mentioned a while ago, or driving the uh, APC that hit the mine. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, it knocked out a bunch of his teeth, and I don't know what all, I, you know, that was, uh, he, did, he did come back, so wow. I think he had to have a bunch of dental work was mostly uh, what it did to him. But wow. he's keeping his, uh, his weapon oiled and greased and you know when we come back that's kind of what we did that when we come out of the field you know get your weapons back you know Just take them apart and clean them yeah and how long was he was he away after being wounded uh several days pr I, not very long probably probably a couple of weeks and then i think he'd go uh you know once in a while off to you know get some dental work done 
That's Terry Garrett. Uh, this is when we were at uh, Quezon, so you Quezon, can see there's yeah. really no signs of anything, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you can see the mountains around it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I didn't realize it just what how old ground that really is and, uh, until, mm -hmm. you know, I watched uh, some documentaries about it and realized the extent of what those guys went through. Um, and that's Terry Garrett, uh, nicknamed mm -hmm. Default. He, he's from uh, Blanchard, Oklahoma. Good, mm -hmm. good soldier, good guy. He he was uh, in my squad, and um, um, so he he was there quite a while after I left. And so he kind of would write me pretty frequently when, when I got home and kind of keep me up on the platoon who was going home and yeah. who got a rear job. And you can see our sea rations in the background there. Right. And that red diamond on my helmet, I'm kind of proud of the old red diamond. That's the 5th Infantry Division. That was our insignia. Yeah. And uh, you see, we didn't didn't have a barber that traveled with her with us. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you passed an inspection. You know, no, probably not. We'd usually get a haircut and we'd come in near a village, and sometimes uh, one would come out and cut her hair at, the, yeah. at our ba fire base. But. And when you're when you're out in the field on a typical uh, mission, uh, how long would you be out? Oh, you know, sometimes we'd stay out 30 to 40 days, and uh, sometimes, you know, I think this one maybe just a week or so. Yeah, 30 but, or 40 days. Yeah, yeah. Just putting up, making tents out of your ponchos at night? Well, or? just, you know, I, I didn't ever make a tent. Some of them would use their poncho and try to rig up something of, you know, over them, but uh, you know, usually it was pretty f f uh, futile to do that. Oh, yeah. So I just put a poncho liner, and and during the rain, you know, uh, you try to find a little high spot. I can remember waking up several times with your ear underwater. Oh, yeah. I did uh, inherit a sleeping bag. Um, one of the old timers was leaving, and I hadn't been in country but a couple of weeks, and I don't know why he picked me, but. Uh, he said, here, I want you to have this and give me a sleeping bag. They weren't Army issue up there at that time, and mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a uh, I feel pretty privileged to get it, but I, I carried that thing. didn't carry it out in the field. I carried it in the armored personnel carrier. So okay. when we were setting up an NDP or night defensive position, you know, I had this sleeping bag, and, and uh yeah, you know, yeah, it was it was nice and warm. You you wouldn't think as they talk about how hot and humid it was that yeah. you'd need a sleeping bag, but it it got pretty chilly at, at night, night up north yeah. at certain times of year. We're having a nice little swim. Uh, that may be the Quaviet River. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, the, I guess the interesting thing about this is we had just come off a hill. Uh, we we had been up on a on a hill and we'd been dug in and. Uh, the NVA zeroed in our, our position with mortars, and mm -hmm. uh, they were, uh, somebody counted them, I don't know, but I, they said there was 50 rounds hit within our perimeter. Wow. And all we could do is hunker down in our little foxholes. And I remember the guy in my foxhole said, uh, you know, what if it hits in our, our foxhole? And I said, well, if it does, it does. I can't do anything yeah, about it, you know. Yeah. And uh, they, they, there, we didn't suffer any casualties from that, and wow. and you could hear the little ploop of the the uh, mortar yeah. round coming. You know how that sound. It's you, it's the same sound when you go to the Fourth of July celebration. You hear them drop yeah, the big that, things. Yeah. It's that little plunk, and and then you wait for the little shh sound, and and just uh, uh, you know, and then you'd hear the explosion, and they hit didn't hit directly in anybody's. Uh, Fire hole. They hit close uh, on a different occasion, and you know, hit really close enough for some guys to get mad back, busted eardrums. I remember one guy bleeding out of both of his ears, and and he was real musically interested person. So I, I don't know if that um, messed his his yeah, career up or not. Yeah. But I didn't see him yeah. again, so he got sent so home. So that was NVA or VC? In NVA. Yeah, our we we usually. Uh, where I was, it was off limits to civilians. So okay. I, I'm fortunate in the fact that I didn't have to worry about who the enemy was. So um, you always know it's NVA. Yeah. On a, on one occasion, yeah. we had a bunch of um, 
civilians come up and pilfer. You know, they tried to find, uh, they, they utilized everything they could find, you know, to build their houses with or whatever, you know. Yeah. And they was coming up pilfering through some of our things that we were throwing away. And it was mm -hmm. women and children and older people. And, you know, we just kind of had to, well, the funny thing about that is our captain told us to pop a round of, uh, of uh, tear gas. Um, and uh, he didn't allow for the windage and the wind you could oh, just yeah. see this cloud of tear gas so we yeah, all right we all boogied the other way and i'm sure the civilians got a pretty good kick out of that i bet they did how, when the nva were, were throwing the, the mortar shells at you uh how close do you think they were no i would say uh, a quarter of a mile they were yeah. close and but you could still hear them oh you could hear it far. plunk you could hear it wow you know they were it yeah. might not have been a quarter of a mile but yeah, yeah and later on i found out from reading and and some of the uh, uh what some of the other soldiers had written that uh, i guess a uh i think one or two rangers uh uh snuck up on them and took them out okay. so yeah got them yeah so now did y'all call in air support or artillery Not support? Not that or? particular time, no. We yeah. just gathered ourselves up and as soon as there was a break, we yeah. took off down the hill and that's when we found this good up, swimming hole and ended up there. And, uh, and set up a little perimeter and had us a good swim. Yeah. Now did they, the guys on watch, uh, you know? They were sitting on top of the armored personnel carriers and, okay. you know. Now, did y'all swap out so that you then get, you right. stood watching yeah. and they got to jump mm -hmm. in for a while? Yeah. Okay. How, do you remember how far into your deployment you were when? Probably about halfway through. About halfway yeah. through. Yeah. So by that time, had, had <coughs> this kind of experience almost, almost become normal? I mean, because if yeah. you look at that photo, and what I see is, you know, a bunch right. of young guys enjoying a swim right. in a beautiful. Yeah, it looks Looks you know, like but, a day in the park, doesn't it? Yeah, but just an hour before, or maybe even less, I, I, you guys you getting know, hit by mortar. Right, fire. and I think you just feel good that you didn't get hit, and you know you're not worried about what's happening next. You're just glad you survived that. Right, but yeah. I think uh, you know your first week or two when you go over there, you're just really mm -hmm. on edge because you know it, a lot of a lot of guys get it. You know when they first get over there for some reason, and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, you know, there's a couple of guys in my platoon that probably were the, were the short timers. They hadn't been there, but uh, uh, you know, less than a month, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't mm. think they were any more in harm's way than anybody else. You know, as a squad leader, I never ask you know any of my new guys to do anything uh, you know that I wouldn't do. But I remember my very first day in the field. Um, you know, I went through this little uh, acclimation time. You know, they show you, you know, if you get lost, what you can eat and how to find your directions. It was kind of yeah. a Mickey Mouse thing for two or three days. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then you go to your unit. And my very first night, my very first day with my unit, uh, we sent out a, a, a night ambush that night. And... Uh, I was, the old platoon sergeant told me to take point. So here I am, my first night in the field in Vietnam, and I'm leading a, <laughs> a wow. night patrol. At night, on point. I, on point. So, you know, some, there were, I, I just never did do that. In fact, I walked point mm -hmm. most of the time. Me and my other squad leaders took turns walking point and bringing up the rear. I wasn't going to ask anybody to do something, you know, that I wouldn't do, and I certainly yeah. wasn't going to put the new guys in harm's way like that. Uh, I think that was pretty common. Though, it was common. It was, it was common, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just never did do that. That's uh, Bob Tibbetts. He was, he was from Glencoe, Minnesota. Um, he was a family man. He had a wife and a, a son. Yeah, I see the ring there. Yeah, and uh, just a, a really good guy. He, like I say, he was a fellow squad leader and, and uh, just a real good friend, and uh, yeah. you can see his little receiver, and uh, there on the right there is his uh, little radio that we, you know, had okay. we could communicate with our platoon leader. And on the and, left side and of with, his helmet, what is that? That's the receiver. That's the receiver. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He's got his bandolier full of M16. Uh, 
He's got a smoke round, you know, most of us carried two or three smoke rounds of different colors, the colors on the yeah. stripe on the out. So when, a, you know, and the, v, the NVA, you know, got pretty smart. They had smoke rounds that they would pop, and so we would, uh, you know, be able to tell the helicopter pilot what, what color, and maybe we would uh, pop two or three wow. different colors so, you know, they could know for sure that it was legitimate place so to come in. The NVA would pop smoke wanting to attract right. the uh, helicopters right. to them yeah. and then they can. Mm -hmm. And so y'all figured that out and so yeah. then you'd communicate with the pilot, go to the place with the right. white and the right. green and if or, he, or whatever. If he had any were. question, we'd pop a different color, you know. He might say pop an orange or whatever, you know, so he'd know it was safe coming in. Well, never safe, but safer, I guess, so. Yeah. It's a very resourceful enemy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've made yeah. that point already, but. Right. Well, they weren't yeah. dumb people, that's for sure. Okay. And they weren't, they were, uh, mm. I mean, I admired them for their tenacity and, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'd see these B-52 strikes out there, you know, and the ground would just shake and we might be two or three miles from it and you know the ground is shaking where we are and I'm thinking man I wouldn't want to be where they are and, yeah. and yet they just hung in there and kept coming they didn't know quit. <laughs> I, I've read Vietnamese accounts about these B-52 right. strikes and they would just they talk about that but, right. but uh, yeah there's that persistence. That, there that is persistence on their part. Did you ever um, you know uh, did you ever have NBA prisoners with you or in your in your time, I or? I uh, I never did. No. Okay. No. I mean, my my uh, my company did, but it wasn't my platoon that took them or anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, and in these you know these, these many incidents that that happen, roughly how many you know what percentage of the time could, did you actually see the enemy? Like if there's an ambush or something, mm -hmm. I mean, did I mean, were there many times where you actually could yeah, see? Yeah. 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 Two or three times, you know. We, okay. we had one big battle where you could see the enemy. Yeah. Uh, you actually fact, see the people, not right, just the muzzle Yeah, functions. and then, then we had a battle in April, and I could definitely see him, you know. And, in fact, I I, uh, I got a hold of my, uh, I didn't, because we were, were supposed to be supported by another platoon, uh, given, uh, you know, bringing up the, the flank and... Yeah. Uh, and I want to make sure it wasn't our own people, so I made contact with my lieutenant. He said, "No, there's nobody out there. If you see them, they're they're the enemy, you know." Yeah. So yeah, and then I've seen them, you know, run and jump in their little bunkers, and you know, out in the field, they had a lot of underground tunnels that uh, I didn't realize to what extent until you know, reading about it later. Just mm -hmm. they had little underground cities, probably all over where we were. Yeah. They could yeah. pop up at any any place, any time. Was it kind of amazing? I mean, because they're, you know, they're pretty small people, mm -hmm. right? And were you kind of amazed at the time that, you know, these folks who, compared to Americans, are pretty small, right. pretty poor, mm -hmm. you know, but they're, they're so tenacious. They are. They're, yeah. you know, tough. Of course, they, you know, they were, they certainly wasn't pampered, you know. A lot of them, uh, some of the, uh, our scouts, our Kit Carson scouts, you know, out in the field, they would catch grasshoppers and eat them, you know. A few times I'd catch some grasshoppers just to see them <laughs> eat them. And they'd... So uh, you caught a grasshopper and yeah, it too? Yeah, and he'd take his little lighter and, and kind of... Kind of cook it? Cook it a little bit and pluck off the big legs and pop them like candy. So they, they were resourceful and they were tough. They wow. were living out on the, the land, you know, yeah. day in, day out. They didn't have a uh, you yeah. know, uh, a fire base to go back to. They were just out Jeez. there. In fact, I think that's why some of them defected was, uh, you know, they just wasn't getting to go on leave. You know, they may mm. out be out in the field for a year and not see their family or get any mail or, yeah. I mean, they had it tough. I'm taking these guys out on a night ambush and um, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, we was going out of <coughs> Alpha 4, that's Contian. Alpha 4 was another name for Contian. Oh, and um, there's just one gate in and out. Yeah. And uh, as we were going out the gate, we started receiving uh, fire from our, from our uh, perimeter, uh, M79 rounds, and they were 
you know, tell they were walking them in toward us, and mm -hmm. I got on my radio, and I kind of chewed out the captain. In fact, I didn't kind of chew him out. I, you know, I told him he was responsible for making sure the perimeter, everybody on guard duty knew we were going out. And, and oh, so uh, these are friendlies. Yeah, these are friendlies. Oh, uh, you know, we're just barely out of the gate, you know, yeah. maybe 50 yards out, and we start taking this fire. And it was, you know, our captain or somebody had miscommunicated that we were going out yeah. and to be be aware. And, you know, the guys on guard duty saw movement and started shooting some rounds. So I was pretty hacked off that time. And uh, Wow. But no no injuries? No injuries. They, did, they, they got the word pretty quick so to the guards. Yeah, too. yeah. And so we, we, we would go out about a mile from the from our base camp, you know, just uh, I think what was there one to seven or eight of us, yeah, and set up a, and a night night uh, uh, ambush never made any sense to me because you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. You could just have to listen for for movement and uh, yeah. you know when I, when I got out there, I called in artillery and I shot it way over our heads and then you can tell them drop 100 yards or whatever until you get it close enough and then yeah. then they got that uh, uh, in case you need it during the night. Uh, you, you don't have to recalculate, you can just say, you know, fire for effect. On these night, these night ambushes then, you're out there and basically you're just listening then for right. movement coming in and... Right. I remember one night, uh, uh, ambush we were on there was I think uh, probably two squads there was about 10 or 15 of us out there and we're on this ridge and uh, just in a line you know and you don't know what the, the guys next to you you know was, and I was my setup right next to a uh, a, a big old uh, uh, bomb crater mm. and so in the middle of the night I heard somebody tracking through the brush and fell down in my bomb crater. I heard him, you know, moaning and groaning and scratching to get out. And, mm -hmm. and I had my M16, you know, mm -hmm. off safety and just ready to, and I thought, that gummit, is that, uh, did one of my guys get up to, you know, relieve himself and fall down in my hole? And uh, I didn't want to shoot one of my own guys. And you yeah. can't say, hey, is that you? Or, you know, then they, yeah. if it was the enemy, then they know right where you are. So. I just listened to him scratch his way out the next morning. Sure enough, uh, one of the NBA had tripped over the guy down for me oh and gosh. took off running and fell in my hole. So wow. I could have got him, but wow. uh, I didn't want to. I was right on the edge of my, I was on the edge of the, uh, of the bomb crater. crater and he was down in it. So he was <laughs> 20 feet from me, you know. And wow. it's a good thing he scratched his way out of the other side if he'd have come out on my side with it. Had a little hand-to-hand -hand combat, I guess. I guess it's kind of funny. Uh, that guy, if he's still alive, he's probably got a good story to tell <laughs> his grandkids. But I mean, I just all but pulled the trigger, but I thought, uh, well, Stanley uh, uh, Tejeda, he, uh, he was just down for me, and I thought, well, you know, he might have got up, and it's dark, and he fell down in there, and, and uh, I didn't want to shoot him. How long did this whole, how long did it take for this whole thing to play out? Oh, just, you know, a minute, you know, he yeah. falls in there and I hear him, you know, knock the wind out of him and then I hear him trying to, you know, crawl out and, um, wow. but, uh, gosh, so but, I mean, but, that illustrates yeah, but I, literally I, how close I, you guys are getting. I just didn't want to take a chance on, yeah. I mean, it's just dark. Right. But yeah, you have a lot of encounters and, you know, uh, friendly fire, you know, uh, I, I was trained in mortars, but, uh, I just didn't feel adequate with mortars uh, because I just didn't want to drop around on one of our own people because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, it's not an exact science. There's a lot of Kentucky windage and, you know, eyeballing where you're going to put it. I mean, it sure. is a science to some degree, but not an exact science. I didn't feel confident with it. And, you know, the tankers almost got took me out once, me and a fellow soldier named Bud uh, Wagner, we, my lieutenant told me to get somebody and go out and kind of recon this area. We was in working with the tankers, you know, a lot of times we'd go out with the tankers, you know, we'd be like two armored personnel carrying a tank. And, yeah. and they had the big guns and uh, 
So we're out there, you know, 50 to 100 yards, and uh, the NVA soldier pops his head up between, he's between us and the tankers, and he starts shooting at the tankers. So I hear their big gun coming around, making that sound, and I thought, oh boy. And the so, NVA did that intentionally. Right? I think so, yeah. And so yeah. they, uh, so me and Bud got as close to the ground as we could, and sure enough, the tankers started they had a shotgun round, which is just basically like a big shotgun. It's or a beehive round, some of yeah, them call it. Yeah. And I mean, they're shooting right over our head, and it makes a beehive sound. If we'd have raised our hand up, you know, it would have just. So I finally got on my radio and got the, got him stopped. Jeez. And so, uh, you know, that yeah. I was, that made me more mad than scared. And yeah. so I come in and I'm, I'm chewing out that tanker big mm -hmm. time and. I chewed on him for five minutes, and uh, mm. and finally he said, "You know I outrank you, don't you?" And I said, "Then you ought to know better." And mm. <laughs> I walked off. But you know, I I wasn't scared as I was mad I over understand. that deal. But yeah. you know, so there's yeah. a lot of casualties from so-called friendly oh, yeah. friendly fire in war. As you look at those faces, uh, anything especially? Well, that's uh, that's Linville on the right. And Linville's to the right of yeah. here in the center, and Linville's right. to the right of you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Michael Linville. Right, right Michael right. Linville. Michael yep. Linville. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. uh, the guy you can't see his face with the watch on right next to me, that's Vernon Russ. Vernon Russ. And uh, that's Rodriguez. And then that's uh, Snyder. Rodriguez is on, he's, he's right. on your, your right, right shoulder. Right there, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Behind you. And then and that's uh, uh, Daryl Snyder. To, to the left of the back there, okay. nicknamed Crow. Yeah. And uh, then we had a medic uh, that was a conscientious objector, but he, he, he would, uh, you know, go out with us and yeah, stuff. So, yeah, he, but he didn't, yeah. didn't carry a weapon. It was, it was a pretty uneventful night. We didn't make any okay. contact. Yeah. The worst thing that happened is the medic stood up in the middle of the night and announced to the whole world that he had to uh, <laughs> relieve yourself, and here we're supposed to be undetected, so several of us had to tackle him and he say a few choices. He decided choice to make an announcement to planet Earth about <laughs> Right, yeah. and we're supposed to... What, did he lose it or something, or he just I, wasn't thinking? I or, just uh, wasn't thinking, I guess, or I don't know. <laughs> Let me ask you about the medic real quick. Um, so, you know, not a pacifist. I mean, he's willing right. to be involved, right. but not willing to carry a weapon. Mm -hmm. How did y'all feel about the medic, I mean, did you, were you okay with it because he's still part of the team or? Yeah, you know, yeah, I, you know, I didn't hold it against him and I, and I kind of admired him, the fact that he was willing to, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, it would take more courage to go out there without a weapon, you know, so. Well, kind of related so, to the story yeah. you told about right. when your weapon wasn't operable. Right, you know? so yeah. I, I think his, uh, you know, it was legitimate how he felt and he was willing to, you know, do willing his part. So I, was he, do you know, was he a Seventh-day Adventist or something I, like that? You know, that? I don't remember. I, he so. wasn't there very long and I didn't okay. get a chance to really get to know him really well. We're out in uh, some of the tall grass, uh, you know, between the, the mountains there and uh, that's uh, Lindo, Tony, Lindo. Tony Lindo from Ohio, uh -huh. and um, he uh, he was on that uh, personnel carrier that hit the mine, and it mm -hmm. uh, ended up breaking his back. Wow. Fortunately, you know, wasn't uh, the type of fracture that uh, compromised his spine and paralyzed him. So he he's I've been in contact with him. Oh, yeah. And he's doing okay, other than I guess he's got a form of leukemia that they've got it under control. It could that, maybe relate to Agent Orange, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. uh, it is, but uh, yeah. anyway, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Lindo. Lindo. Now, did he... Um, he was yeah, a, I mean, uh, a sergeant also and a squad leader, too. Okay. And now his back was broken, so that probably means he's out of Yeah, he, he, he went home. He's done, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how about this one here? That's our uh, Kit Carson scout, Boy Tang. And uh, he was, um, these are uh, VC and NVA soldiers that have been captured or, came, or defected or whatever came over to our side. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had several of them. Um, Boy Tang was, you know, legitimate, I feel like, a, a good soldier. and. 
and uh, trustworthy and uh, you know he hung, he was with our platoon pretty much you know all the time yeah and uh, we had some that you know I really uh, doubt that they were really converted to our side you think uh, some of them might have been infiltrators I think some of them were you know yeah. and uh, uh, did we, some of them ever disappear and you just kind of uh, assume that they, they went back or no not okay. that I know of but okay. uh, uh, we would get rocket attacks uh, occasionally, or pretty often, uh, yeah. up there on, on uh, Conti Ann. Uh, there was a mountain range, they called it Rocket Ridge, because that's where most of the rockets mm -hmm. come from. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't real accurate, but uh, it seemed like to me, and we all noticed it, that uh, we got hit the hardest when, when some of those uh, scouts were on leave and so uh, after a while I'm, it doesn't look like I'm, a coincidence I'm anymore. thinking why don't the big brass uh, pick up on this yeah, you know? yeah. and maybe they did I don't yeah. know but they did uh, now, but were, you all, were you all able to call in artillery fire or, or aircraft fire on Rocket Ridge uh yeah okay, yeah but most of the time they were gone by the time you know they'd pop in three or four rockets and they'd be gone you know I see so yeah yeah so this uh, this fellow here, you you trusted him, uh, but others you didn't feel like, right. like you could trust. Right. Right. Um, did you? I'm guessing you had to communicate through an, an interpreter, or did he speak? He just English? kind of broken English, you know. No, he okay. did, we didn't have an interpreter. Yeah. He just. Did you have any idea why he switched sides? Did it have anything to do with communism or anything? I, like that, know, or? I never never did dis really yeah. discuss that with him. Right. Yeah. You just don't know. And don't know. Do you have any idea how things ended up for him? No, I don't. I, w I wish I did know because he, he was a, a good little guy and mm. I hope things went good. But, uh, you know, um, if they yeah. caught him, it, I'm sure he's it didn't go good if for the, him. When uh, the NBA came down uh, and conquered the South. Right. Yeah. Did you do any operations at all with the Arvins? The yeah, we not specifically with them, but I mean they were in our area, and we yeah. saw them a lot of times out in the field. They'd be on an operation, and we'd we'd go by them. And uh, you know the general consensus with us was they really wasn't very dedicated soldiers, and and I read others that said they thought they were really good soldiers, you know, mm. but uh, the ones that uh, we saw just didn't feel like they were yeah. were really uh, in yeah. it. I never yeah. did feel like they were committed to yeah. the war. Did that, was, that was something that occurred to you at the time? That mm -hmm. they didn't seem to be just, committed to the war. Yeah, fight? just kind of my observation of yeah. them. And yeah, so the did the, I mean, so then a next thought could be, well, if they're not committed to the fight, then why, Why should, should I be? be? Yeah. yeah. Did that ever go through no, your mind? No, it didn't. You just, just thought I'm going to do my job the best I can. And yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. unfortunate they're not not that dedicated. Yeah. After six months in country, what is your job? I mean, if when you're flying over, this is about, you know, at least, if nothing else, putting the brakes on, on the spread of communism, right. which I think you can say the Vietnam War did. I mean, put the brakes right. on it. Um, if that's what the war is about, according to the folks who are getting you ready to go, yeah. is it still about that six months, six months into it? Well, you know, it, it gets to be a little more towards, you know, staying alive and keeping your, your uh, if you're a you know, squad leader or something, looking after your, your men and trying to yeah. keep them alive. And uh, But, you know, I still felt like, you know, we had a, a job to do and felt like the the protesters and uh, you know mm -hmm. the, the objectors and the people that you know fled the country I still felt like they were in the wrong and uh, mm -hmm. still felt dedicated to being the best soldier I could you know yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a it becomes a very uh, small world right I mean mm -hmm. you know this whole right. thing is I have no idea what's going on in Saigon but this is you know right. this world is me and yeah. the guys with me and that's it Pretty much, and you know, uh, I wasn't aware. I've learned a lot more reading about all the what the big brass were discussing and their battle plans, and yeah. you know, should we do this and should we do that? My, yeah. I was 
you know, I was in my little, I guess you could say, own world own with my, world. my platoon yeah. and uh, taking care of my men, grass, you know, and, and everything came down from the big brass and yeah. that's what we did, uh, you know, and that seemed to change from day to day. We, we called it rumor control, you know, the, mm -hmm. the tactical operation command was kind of mm -hmm. rumor control, we're going to do this or we're going to do that and seemed yeah. like you got to where you didn't pay much attention. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, take care of your area of responsibility and let whoever's in charge of the tactics worry about that, yeah. I guess. Well, that is Stanley Otto Tejeda, and he was from California, and he was not a citizen until he went on R&R &R and uh, yeah. took the test and everything and come back as a citizen. Well, where uh, did, he, did he go to Hawaii? Hawaii, yeah. Well, on R &R. But he was uh, a unique character. Um, so uh, the... Uh, the uh, squad leaders, we had kind of had an agreement, you know, mm -hmm. whenever the new guys come in, uh, we took turns having first choice, you know. So oh, uh, you get to choose? Yeah. Like, when the new we, guy comes in? Yeah, we, we took turns. Oh, okay. So when Stanley come in, uh, I got out of turns. Tibbetts was supposed to be his turn to pick, but these... Uh, Stanley, we was a little short guy, and then this big old strong guy, and we was digging foxholes, and and I picked the big guy, and and, uh, and let Tibbetts have Stanley, <laughs> and then Tibbetts come over and said, Leach, it, it wasn't your turn to pick, and I said, yeah, I guess you're right, I picked out a turn, so he took the big old guy, and I ended up with Stanley, so, but uh, I'm glad it worked out that way, because Stanley was a, a good guy, and he was... Uh, Oh, he's happy and a good soldier and yeah. provide a lot of entertainment, yeah. but uh, so it all worked yeah. out. And he got his citizenship. In he got Hawaii his citizenship. Came back a citizen. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Um, how about you? Where did you go in R&R? &R? I went to Australia. Went to Australia. Yeah. yeah. Two weeks there? I think it was, same, yeah, 10 days maybe, something okay. like that. And did you have a choice about where you could yeah. go? Mm -hmm. okay. Why'd yeah. Why did you pick Australia? Oh, I just always wanted to go to Australia, it just seemed yeah. like, a, you know, a, uh, be a good place, you know, a lot of, a lot of different yeah. terrain and everything. Of course, we weren't supposed to get, I can't remember if it was, we wasn't supposed to go more than 50 miles or something like that from, we, we ended up in Sydney, Australia. Okay, Sydney. And uh, I just wanted to kind of get away and there was, uh, you know, some of the local people, you know, had programs where they, you could go out to their place and, yeah. and, uh, and I, uh, I went out and stayed several days with this this dairy farmer, huh. and uh, went to you know a, a sale cow sale with him and uh -huh. drove a tractor and yeah. picked oranges and just kind of a uh, you know relaxing time. Yeah, and he grew up around cattle, right? If I remember yeah, because right. mm -hmm. sure you, you let me read your letters and I right. noticed that you asked a lot about the cows. Right. And I think even one one or two cows were named, if I remember Pro correctly. Yeah, so yeah, we had names, of course. Asking about the cows. I always ask about the old dogs, old Sandy. The country's up, and you come back to the U.S., and it, was it one of those things you, you hear vets talk about where they're in, you know, they're out in some rice paddy on Tuesday, or they're in the elephant grass on Tuesday, and then on Friday they're back on the farm and... Right. Nebraska or something. Was right. it kind of like that for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. yeah. I'm like out in the uh, out in the field, and you know, every time you process out over there and fly and process out in country, you're looking at about three days. You know, so you, you're going from the battlefield to you know, and, mm -hmm. and there's an adjustment for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, noises and things like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it really affect you because you're used to, you know, responding to those kind of things because yeah. it could mean live or die if you don't, if you don't respond. And so you Were there some incidents like that, a loud noise or something? Yeah. And you just kind of responded instantly? Well, I, I remember sitting in my brother's uh, house uh, and it was, uh, you know, the wind was blowing. He had the, the door open and it slammed shut and just, mm. you know, I mean, I just instinctively you know, hit the ground and got in a mode to fight something, you know, and so it takes yeah. takes a while for you to acclimate and realize yeah. you don't have to respond to every, every loud, loud noise yeah, uh, because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know. Um, it, how long would you say it took you to, to kind of wind down? Well, um, 
I remember the first Fourth of July. I didn't really want to, and, and Fourth of July had always been one of my favorites. You know, I remember popping firecrackers. But the fourth, first Fourth of July, which would have been if I come home in October, we were summer, January, you know, seven months or whatever, you know, eight months. Uh, I, I didn't feel like participating in those loud noises, so mm -hmm. probably maybe a, a year, okay. you know. Okay. And and you still, you know, um, you'll hear a lot of veterans talk about when you go to a restaurant or something, they don't like to sit with their back to everybody, and I, I still feel that way, you know, yeah. you feel exposed because you're in a, a night defensive perimeter and you're you're always facing out mm -hmm. and your brothers have got your backside and so you know yeah. um you just feel exposed yeah. so just that thing in a restaurant if you're kind of in a corner but your back is to everybody it's just hard really to settle yeah it's just an yeah. uneasy kind of a feeling it's not a something that just paralyzes and you can you can get through it if you just right. don't think about it but still right. you'd rather sit yeah. facing everybody yeah if uh Somebody offered you an all expenses paid trip to, uh, you know, Old I Corps, yeah. Doha, Fubai, uh, Quezon, and Quang Tree, and Kantian, and all that. Would you? Would you take it? I, I probably would. You know, I, I'd realize that it's um, it's nothing like it used to be. I've seen the pictures that you brought back, yeah. and. You know, Compton is a village with with uh, streets, and and uh, it was a, either a dust bowl or a mud hole the whole time I was there, with hardly any vegetation. I mean, yeah. you wouldn't know it's the same place. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you yeah. know, I've often thought about would I like to go back over? I'd probably step on a mine that I missed the first <laughs> time or something. <laughs> there, you know, they're still out there finding them. I wouldn't be surprised. There, yeah, I, you know. I came across a. I came across a, a couple vans from some organization yeah. around the country up in i -Corps looking for these things. So. Well, they, you know, around County Inn, the, the reason we come and get, went through that one gate, you know, there wasn't any mines that they, there was supposedly marked and even some unmarked mines set all the way around, mm -hmm. you know, our perimeter. Yeah. So uh, I'm yeah. sure there's some of them still out there that haven't been found. Yeah. Uh, last last question. I've, I've asked this of, of several vets, and I'm always interested in the response. You had, you know, there there are, are some stories that you and I have talked about before that we haven't talked about here, and and of course, you know, you saw a lot of combat, and uh, so a lot of a lot of tough memories. Um, if I had uh, if I had a, a a potion, and I said, Ken, you know, all you need to do is just take a teaspoon of this potion, and you get to keep all the good memories of the time in Vietnam, you know, the, the funny incidents and the, right. that sense of camarader camaraderie. You get, to, you get to keep all of that, but, you, but the potion will make all of, the, all of the tough memories go away. Would you take it? <coughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a part of who I am, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it has molded me to, to some extent, you know, you talk about people being a different person when they come back and, you know, I guess I'm the same person with a different perspective and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I guess some of those memories have kind of are part of kind of who I am, you know, I uh, I grew up a lot in, in uh, you know, the Vietnam. I was the youngest of eight kids and, wow. and uh, you know, it just was a, a time of uh, maturing uh, mentally and emotionally for me and yeah. learning to deal with certain things and so, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I'd erase any of it. Mm. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, you don't, don't want to dwell on those things, but uh, in some fashion or way, they probably help mold you into what you become, I guess.